Remember we said that the power in direct current would have been I times V. Well, it looks like there's no difference so far. This was also I times V, but that's just because resistors are the simplest element that you can put in alternating current. We're going to have to see what to do with capacitors and inductors. But a resistor is very simple because its current and its voltage are in phase with each other. We can use phasors to describe the relationship between two things. So suppose that this line represents the current. Then we can use the same line to represent the voltage across the resistor. And that would show that they're in phase with each other. The fact that we're using the same line in this symbology indicates that these two things are in phase with each other. And we would expect that the voltage from the generator here would also be in phase with the voltage across the resistor, because they're in series. So these all three things would be all in phase with each other. Here we have a capacitor and alternating current. With a capacitor, is it hard to change the voltage or is it hard to change the current? Voltage. You said voltage, right? Yeah. I wrote down the wrong one. <coughs> we know that the voltage can't jump. It takes time to change the voltage. So based on that, would you expect that the changes in the voltage would lag the current, or would the changes in the current lag the voltage? The changes in the voltage lag the current? Voltage lags current. It's not hard to change the current through a capacitor, it's hard to change the voltage. So it actually turns out that for a capacitor, the voltage in the capacitor is one quarter cycle behind the current. The voltage in the capacitor is a quarter cycle behind the current. For example, when the current is peaking, when the current is peaking, the voltage is still a quarter cycle behind, which would be down at zero. When the current is peaking, the voltage is still where the current was a quarter cycle ago, down at zero. And then when the current has gotten to zero, the voltage is where the current was a quarter cycle ago, which was at the peak. So basically, this graph is just this one shifted over a little bit. It's like it started a little bit late. Everything that the current graph is doing, this graph is doing a quarter, a quarter cycle later. At this point, this is at equilibrium, but it takes a quarter cycle before the voltage gets to equilibrium. Now this is a decrest, but it takes a quarter cycle before the voltage is decrest. That's what the phasor diagram is trying to show here. I was trying to draw this as a 90 degree angle. This represents symbolically, 90 degrees is like a quarter circle. So this is a way of symbolically representing that we're a quarter of cycle behind the voltage in the capacitor is a quarter cycle behind the current. Remember, it was not nearly so complicated for the resistor. In the resistor, the current and the voltage were always in phase with each other. For the resistor, the two graphs would just be right on top of each other. It was so simple I didn't even bother drawing the graph. So this is what the phasor helps us to see, 
in the resistor, for alternating current, the resistor is very simple. When the current is peaking, the voltage is peaking. But in the capacitor, it's not the same. We can see that when the current is peaking, the voltage is at zero. And then when the voltage is peaking, the current is at zero. So these are totally different places. That's what the phasor diagram here is telling us. Now we know that for a resistor, we have V equals IR. Resistors have resistances. Now, a capacitor doesn't really have a resistance. A capacitor doesn't really have a resistance. However, it has something that can, we can treat as analogous to a resistance. A capacitor has something that we can call a reactance. Does that sound at all familiar? Mm -hmm. That's in the homework problem that you were assigned. Notice how if we put it in the reactance, this looks a lot like, Ohm, like, a lot like Ohm's law. However, we can't use this for any old voltage or current, because this is not exactly like re resistance. Instead, we can only use this for peak or root mean squared. So we could say that the peak current in the, in the capacitor is equal to the, um, the peak voltage equals the peak current times the reactance. Or we could say that the root mean squared voltage equals the root mean squared current times the reactance. Again, we have to be consistent. So we can use this somewhat like a resistance if we're consistent about peaks or root mean squares. But this does not give us the actual level at any other point in time. And it's also important to realize, let's say we use this to find the peaks. We have to keep in mind, this doesn't mean that the peaks are happening at the same time. Remember that the peak voltage is happening here, whereas the peak current happened here, because the voltage is lagging behind the current. So this can seduce us into thinking that they're peaking at the same time. They're not. We're just using the same equation to figure out what this will be when it peaks and what the current will be at when it peaks. But the peaks still happen at different times. The voltage here lags the current. And there is a, uh, okay, good. Now, how about for an inductor? Well, for an inductor, is it hard to change the voltage or is it hard to change the current? The current. It's hard to change the current. So who should lag, the current or the voltage? The current. The current should lag. That means the voltage should be ahead of the game. So in a phasor diagram, the voltage here should be leading the current. The voltage in the inductor is a quarter cycle ahead of the current, just like the voltage in the capacitor is a quarter cycle behind the current. We can use the same graphs as before to represent that. Now we just have to say that this is the voltage and this is the current. And now we're saying that the current is behind the voltage in the inductor. Before we were saying that the voltage in the capacitor was a quarter cycle behind the current in the capacitor. Well, now we're saying that the current in the inductor is a quarter cycle behind the voltage in the inductor. And that's what this type of phasor diagram here indicates. And if you keep that in mind, There's also a reactance for inductors that gives you something like Ohm's law. Just like you can use XC like a resistance, you can use XL like a resistance. Or you could use root mean squares if you were consistent. But don't let this make you think that these are peaking at the same time. We know that the voltage in the inductor is peaking a quarter cycle before the current in the inductor peaks. But we can still use this one equation to figure out what the values will be at the peak. This raises the question, how do we figure out what the reactances are? Well, remember that we're going through a cyclic process here. Therefore, there must be some frequency to the cycle. And we can use the angular frequency, omega. Remember that omega is our symbol for angular frequency in radians per second. That tells us how many radians per second the frequency is of the alternating current source. 
Here's the equations for the reactances. This is the reactance in the capacitor, and this is the reactance in the inductor. So we just need to have these in our cheat sheet. And remember that we can treat these kind of like resistances, because they kind of fit into something that's kind of like Ohm's law. 